This video is for the NXL GCSE in Astronomy, Topic 1, which is about the Earth. So these slides I prepared for my students in Year 7 and 8 who I teach GCSE Astronomy to. First of all, the specification for this particular part, and you can see some of the basic uh, ideas about the Earth that we're going to be working through in this short video. The shape of the Earth is not perfectly spherical, neither is it flat. It is a, what we call an oblate spheroid. It's spheroid, in other words, it's like a sphere, but not quite. Oblate just means it's squashed a little bit. And the reason why it's squashed a little bit is because as the Earth rotates, centrifugal forces cause it to bulge out a little bit. Now I know what you're thinking, centrifugal forces don't exist. Well, they are fictitious forces, yes. That means in an inertial reference frame, you can't measure them. They don't exist, but they do exist in a non-inertial reference frame, such as an accelerating reference frame. And the surface of the Earth is accelerating because it's moving in a circle. And so you can measure a centrifugal force on the surface of the Earth. And that means that the matter is pushed outwards if you look at the picture from the accelerating reference frame from the surface of the Earth. You can see from that little sketch there the, um, the level of eccentricity, the, the level of squashedness of the Earth's shape. It's not very squashed at all, really. There's another picture that shows you just how squashed it is, where the dotted circle there is a circle, a perfect circle, and the pink shaded area is the uh, shape of the Earth. It's not very squashed at all. Now, for your GCSE, you will have to know that number, 13,000 kilometres, the mean diameter of the Earth. Another thing we have to look at is what the Earth is made of the inside of the earth and so you can see in this slide we've split open the earth into the different layers the crust the mantle then we get towards the core which is separated into inner core and outer core and the crust really is thin uh, we're talking five or five or ten kilometers thick for um, the areas underneath the oceans, a little bit thicker for the areas um, where the land is, the continental areas, but still, in general, it is very, very thin compared to the diameter of the Earth. And the crust is split into plates, tectonic plates, the fault lines that connect those plates, those fault lines between those plates, are where the crust is very, very thin. So thin, in fact, that the uh, magma from the mantle beneath can move up through the crust. And these plates float around on the mantle. And the mantle itself isn't liquid, as is often thought. It's mostly solid, but it sort of behaves like a very thick, a very viscous liquid over very long time scales. And we mean geological time scales millions, no, billions of years. Well, not quite that many. Millions of years. Over these geological timescales, the tectonic plates move around and the mantle can look a little bit more like a, like a fluid. It is flowing, but very, very slowly. And underneath that mantle, there is the core separated into two parts, the inner core and the outer core. Now, the outer core is a liquid. It's so hot that the iron and nickel that are in the outer core melt. And there's convection happening within that outer core. Um, the movement of a hot fluid, we know, causes a magnetic field. And so this magnetic field that's produced in the outer core is the Earth's magnetic field. Now, the inner core, right down in the middle, that's where the... And so the iron nickel becomes solid and it becomes solid because there's so much pressure in that inner core and there's so much pressure because of the weight of all of the outer core and the mantle and the crust and then all the atmosphere pushing down on it so even though it is incredibly hot uh, as it says there roughly the same temperature as the surface of the sun it is not liquid even though iron and nickel melt easily at that temperature, it's not a liquid because of that huge pressure. 
Now we have really only been able to dig into the crust. We haven't managed to get all the way down into the mantle and into the core at all. So the way we know about all this is through experiments where we look at the acoustic waves that pass through from one side of the Earth to the other. And we analyze those acoustic waves to try to figure out what the inside of the Earth is made out of. Now to refer to points on the Earth's surface, we use a coordinate system of latitude and longitude. Latitude is how far north and south you are. Longitude is how far east and west you are. I don't know how you're going to remember that. I'm sure you can come up with some clever mnemonic to remember that. Um, but the, the difficulty is that the latitude lines that tell you how far north and south you are are drawn around the Earth this way. And the longitude lines, they're all the same length, those, those lines go th uh, through the North and South Pole. Maybe that's one mnemonic to remember it. The longitude lines are all the same length. And long, length, longitude, length. Maybe that's the easiest way to remember it. And so a latitude is given as an angle. If you are on the equator, your latitude is zero degrees. If you are 45 degrees north, then you are halfway between the equator and the geographic North Pole. And if you are 90 degrees north, then you are on the geographic North Pole. There is no 100 degrees north or, or so on. Then you can see the same thing going southwards. Longitude can either be given as a time or it can be given as an angle. And here we're using an angle. So we have uh, zero degrees starting from Greenwich. That's just where we start it from because when this was first put forward London was the cultural center of the world or so the British Empire thought and um, and so we have uh, going eastwards increasing in angle and going westwards uh, it well either decreasing angle or say increasing angle westwards so we could say we are I don't know 20 degrees east or 30 degrees west so looking at a map like this, we might have to uh, figure out where we are in different places. So we see, we see where we are here. Spain, let's say. Roughly, what is the coordinate of Spain? It looks like it's about 40 degrees north, but how far east and west? Maybe between 5 and 10 degrees to the west. And so the latitude, we've got, what was it, did I say it was? 40 degrees to the north, and between 5, 10 degrees to the west is the longitude. Here's a slightly bigger picture to help us out, perhaps. So let's take Iceland, for example. So we are 60, hmm, difficult to see, but a little bit more than 60 degrees to, well, near enough 65 degrees to the north. And we are, well, let's say, 20 degrees to the west. Now, certain lines of latitude have a special name, such as the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. The Tropic of Cancer is about 23 degrees north and the Tropic of Capricorn is about 23 degrees south. And the region between these two, at some point in the year, the sun will be directly overhead. Anywhere outside the Tropic of Cancer or the Tropic of Capricorn, this region between, which we call the tropics, the sun's never directly overhead. Then, in terms of longitude lines, there's a special longitude line called the Prime Meridian, which used to be called the Greenwich Meridian because it passes through Greenwich. And right at the top of the Earth, the northmost point on the Earth, we've got the North Pole, and at the bottom we've got the South Pole. But what do we mean by that? Well, there are different North and South Poles. And so, labelled here, you can see pole labelled A. This pole moving through the Earth labelled A would be the axis of rotation. And so A1 would be the geographic North Pole, and A2 would be the geographic South Pole. But you can see we also have some sort of magnetic field passing through this Earth, around this Earth. And our, geograph uh, sorry, our magnetic North Pole is represented by B1, this imaginary line B passing through this magnet. But the magnetic poles move over time. Magnetic South Pole is B2. Interestingly, what we call the magnetic North Pole in geography is in fact a magnetic South Pole from a physics point of view because the field lines go in towards that point and the field lines come out from the bottom, so we call that a magnetic North Pole, even though in geography it would be referred to as a magnetic South Pole. 
And so the Earth orbits the Sun like this, with the axis of rotation tilted about 23 degrees to the plane around the Sun that the Earth is orbiting. And that's what gives rise to those tropics, the Tropic of Cancer, the Tropic of Capricorn being about 23 degrees. So when the Sun is directly over the Tropic of Cancer, um, then that's when we're at one extreme end of the orbit. And when the Sun is directly over the Tropic of Capricorn, that's where we're on the other extreme end of the orbit. Now, on this picture here, you can see some of the important points on the Earth labelled. The uh, North Pole and South Pole here, the geographic North Pole on the top, the geographic South Pole on the bottom, that is along a line around which the, um, the Earth will orbit. And so we can refer to that as a, uh, the celestial pole, because when we look up, we can see the same point in the stars above us at that point, no matter where we are in our orbit. Uh, and the same thing with the bottom, the celestial south pole. The stars that you look at um, when you're stood at the celestial south pole, at the, at the geographic south pole, the celestial sphere, the stars, uh, are all the same, just rotating around. Now the Earth rotates in an orbit, as I showed you before, that looks a bit like this. That orbit, where the Sun is in the centre, is in a plane which we refer to as the ecliptic. And so as we move around the ecliptic, um, with the sun always above the sky in the ecliptic somewhere, the celestial equator here is, if we stood on the geographic equator and looked up, what we would see in the sky. A line across the sky that is always above some point on the geographic equator is called the celestial equator. So the celestial poles, the celestial equator, all refer to what it looks like when you stood on the, the geographic coordinates looking up. And the ecliptic is that imaginary line, that imaginary plane in which the Earth orbits. The Earth's atmosphere absorbs radiation. It absorbs electromagnetic radiation from the Sun, from other stars and from other sources. And the amount of radiation that is absorbed can be shown on a graph like this at the top. So opacity, 100% means all of the radiation is absorbed. Visible light is indicated here with this lovely rainbow spectrum, and most of the visible light is able to pass through the atmosphere. That's why it's visible to us. We evolved to be most sensitive to those colours, because those colours are able to reach us on Earth. You can also see that certain radio waves are able to pass through the Earth's atmosphere, but other radio waves are not. And microwaves often are not able to easily pass through the Earth's atmosphere. We also have a big black spot over here with gamma rays and X-rays and ultraviolet. Very little of it actually passes through the Earth's atmosphere. So if we want to detect X-rays, then we need a special X-ray telescope that we put in orbit above the atmosphere so that the X-rays can be detected. If we had an X-ray telescope on Earth, then most of the X-rays, if not all of the X-rays, would be absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, and so it would be pointless. I wouldn't worry too much about the equations here. The point of this is to show that white light from the sun, the blue light is scattered most. And that's why the sky appears to be blue. We call it Rayleigh scattering. What that means is there's less blue light that can be observed along this line where the sun is. And that's one of the reasons why when the sun is very low in the sky, the sky around it starts to look a bit red. It's because the blue light has been scattered off in other directions, so there's less blue light reaching us. And you can see this scatter if you're high enough, where the sky has this sort of blue haze to it. That's because of blue light that's being reflected off the surface of the Earth, then being scattered by that atmosphere. It does mean, of course, that if we look up at the celestial sphere and make observations of stars and indeed planets, some of the colours are going to be a bit distorted by our atmosphere. The atmosphere also affects our observations if there's a lot of light pollution. Scattering all sorts of other lights from particles in the air means it's difficult to observe stars. This picture here, the right-hand side, is exactly the same location as the left-hand side, but there was a big blackout. Well, electrical lighting stopped working in the streets and you could see this beautiful picture of the sky. Those stars are there in the left-hand picture, but you can't see them because the light that's being scattered back from the dust in the air is 
brighter than the light that would be reaching our eyes from the stars. So we don't have that contrast to be able to uh, discern the stars from that picture. Now contrast is an issue. If we don't have the contrast between the dark night sky and the star that we're looking at, you can't see the star. But over time we get better and better at spotting these stars. Our vision becomes adapted to the dark, becomes more sensitive to fainter and fainter light. And it's referred to as dark adapted vision. Our cones, not very good at looking at very poor contrast images. Very good at picking out colours, that's what they're for. But um, when we try to look at the fine detail of a uh, constellation or something, it can be very difficult to spot the stars. The other thing is the cones all tend to be focused exactly where we're looking in our eye. And the rods tend to be around the outside more. And that means that sometimes when you're looking at a particular star, you can't see it. But if you look slightly to one side of where that star should be, all of a sudden you can see it in your peripheral vision. And so averted vision and dark adapted vision, leaving your eyes to become dark adapted, more sensitive to lower intensities of light, uh, mean that you can observe far more if you wait until it's very, very dark and you don't uh, look at anything bright for about half an hour. One way you can preserve your dark adapted vision when you're out in the field making observations is to use a red light source because that preserves your dark adapted vision in a way that blue and red, uh, sorry, blue, green, white light sources don't. If you've got lovely dark adapted vision and then someone shines a torch in your eye, you're going to have to wait half an hour again before you can see the same stars that you could see before. And stars aren't the only thing that uh, we can see through the atmosphere. But the atmosphere affects how things appear. So in this rather crude cartoon here, you can see some of these things are twinkling and other things do not appear to be twinkling. And the things that aren't twinkling aren't twinkling because their solid angle in the sky is large enough. Their angular size in the sky is large enough that the light that from them can reach our eye without being distorted too much in the path. Now the stars are so small, they're, angular, they're not small, but the angular size of the stars is so small because of how far away they are, that as that light passes through the atmosphere, turbulence in the atmosphere, normal thermal turbulence, causes the path the light traces to be slightly distorted, which means it enters your eye from slightly different positions. And that gives it the effect of looking like the star is twinkling. Whereas planets, because they're that little bit larger, their angular size in the sky is a little bit larger, any distortion from the edges of the planets, you're not going to notice so much. So, so far we've talked about the shape of the Earth. You know the shape and you know why it's that shape. We've used information, or well, we've got information that we can use in questions later on. We understand the Earth's structure, we've gone through that. We understand the coordinate system we use to refer to points on the surface of the Earth. We understand the different areas within the Earth, the Arctic Circle, where sometimes you never see the sunrise, the Antarctic Circle, where sometimes you never see the sunrise, the Prime Meridian, North Pole, South Pole, those tropics, and the equator, that line that is around the edge of the Earth, exactly halfway between the North and South Pole. And then finally, we looked at the Earth's atmosphere and how it affects observations of the celestial sphere, how observations of the stars and the planets are affected by the Earth's atmosphere. And so that is everything that we needed to know for that first topic. In the next video, we'll be looking at the lunar disk. So make sure you uh, look for that video, tune in and enjoy.